Well, I'm joined in the studio now by the Global Events Analyst, Marco Vicencino. Marco, thanks for joining me. Um, let's start off with this Saudi fighter jet that's allegedly been shot down. Um, this is going to inflame the situation, isn't it? Are, are we expecting Saudi reprisals now? I think it'll just be continuing. Saudi bombings will continue consistently. Uh, what you do is a lot of intensification on the border between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. That's causing much concern because today those are actually bombings of an actual uh, border crossing, which is, it's not been seen on this conflict yet. So they're actually, it's, it's very, very close uh, in terms, it's intensifying on the borders and it's intensifying throughout the country itself. The first phase of the bombing, of the Saudi bombing was about, of the coalition bombing, one could call it, was about destroying and downgrading the heavy weaponry of the Houthis, particularly their ability to shoot down Saudi jets. So we need to still see the outcome of the story, if this report is true or not. If, it's not. if it is true, it brings into question how effective that bombing may have been, although 100% you can't rid them of that, of their ability to do so, but there was a heavy downgrading, but there still may be elements that are still active. We need to see the outcome. The, the facts aren't clear yet. It does seem, though, that the Houthis are pretty much in control of Yemen now. The Saudi-led airstrikes that they don't seem to be hitting home, do they? In the Saudi uh, airstrikes, like I said, the first phase was about downgrading their heaven weaponry. Generally speaking, it seems to have been done. Secondly, when you look at Yemen, it's a, it's a vast country, population 24 million people, but you have heavily po heavy population centers and you have rural areas. Now, if you make a distinction between the old North Yemen and then South Yemen before they became a united country, if you look at North Yemen, Houthi forces c controlled the majority of what was North Yemen, particularly the urban areas, and some other areas that have influence over. Now, if you look at South Yemen, and South Yemen's places like the strategic port city of Aden, Aden is, is still is heavy, intense fighting going on. And then you have other areas of former South Yemen, which some fall under government control, and other major areas are, are under uh, al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda domination, which is called ICAP, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. They're controlling vast This is the most land. deadliest form of yeah. Al-Qaeda, isn't it? This is the most effective out of all the... Particularly the, the southern part, that's where they're having huge, huge, uh, massive controls of, of parts of land. Um, their ability to operate in different parts of the country. Okay, let's look at loss of life. Um, earlier in the week, an a, apparent bomb killed a family of six in a, in a car near a military base. Um, yet the Saudis are denying that there are any civilian deaths, aren't they? They're being very cagey about this. You have to make a distinction between collateral damage. And then on the other side, there's um, uh, what you call bombings, uh, indiscriminate bombings, we can call it. Now, from their perspective, when you have a, it's a UN authorized action that's taking place. Now, when you're bombing strategic spots, there's always the, ch uh, there's the chance that if it's within urban areas, there can be collateral damage, loss of innocent life. But the key question was their intent in doing that. It doesn't seem to be. Uh, but it's inevitable at times when you have these type of strategic bombings taking place. On the other side, you have indiscriminate bombings of civilian centers with intent or reckless disregard for human life. Now, what the Saudis are accusing the Houthis of in places like the port city of Aden, in Aden is actually this neighborhood, this fighting going on, intense fighting from neighborhood to neighborhood, and they're actually intentionally shelling areas where ordinary citizens live. So the Saudis will say, we're, we're, our use, there may be some collateral damage, but no intent. On the other part, they're saying the Houthis in civilian areas are actually using indiscriminate violence and loss of civilian life taking place. But whether it's with intent or not, this is becoming a humanitarian disaster. I mean, we're, we're hearing about boatloads of Yemenis who are escaping to Djibouti. When they're getting to Djibouti, are they being made welcome? What's waiting for them in Djibouti? The United Nations High Commission for Refugees, UNHCR, has said that there's about 5,000 now. It's, it's ironic because the, always the migration would go from Africa into Yemen in the past. Now with the conflict, it's the reverse. The 5,000 who are arriving are being taken care of by the UN, but as long as con content, the, con the conflict continues and it continues to spin out of control, you may be seeing more arriving into Djibouti. Djibouti is a very small country, struggling economy, their resources are limited, and that may require more commitments from the international community in terms of helping out with UNHCR receive more of these refugees from conflict. Okay, we've got these peace talks coming up on, I think, the 28th. Um, 
We're hearing conflicting reports as to whether they're going to be successful. What's your take on this? Do, do you see them as being able to achieve anything? Uh, probably premature. Very difficult because they still can't agree on the basics. On the one hand, the Houthis are saying, if we come, we're coming with no conditions attached. On the other hand, the government's saying, well, you still have to comply with the United Nations Security Council resolution, which calls for basically the disarming of the Houthis and for them to put, pull out, to withdraw from the areas that they control. That's not taking place. Now, that even if you have that United Nations Security Council resolution, the question is how do you enforce it? And it's not enforceable. The Houthis see themselves in a position of strength right now. They've cons consolidated many of their gains, and at the same time, they're looking to uh, negotiate from a position of strength. At the, and so we don't know yet exactly what happens. In my opinion, the violence is going to continue for the foreseeable future. But President Hardy has said that he doesn't feel that he can actually go to the peace talks because he fears for his own security. I mean, how significant, yeah, is, I mean, significant it, is that? I mean, the peace talks would be in, in Geneva, in Switzerland, so I don't think there'd be any difficulties with his personal safety. I think it means in terms of his, he, his ability, if he were to ever go into Yemen, to, to direct, to negotiate and direct Yemen. Yeah, I mean, his life would be in danger in Yemen. That's why he's in exile at the present time in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but overall, this, this, this violence is going to continue for the foreseeable future. At the, the, the Houthis saying, we've survived all these two months of bombing. Before we come to the table, we want to get, we want to receive something in return. We're in a strong position. And this may require ultimately some form of UN peacekeeping mission to be able to bring both sides together and to try to br and basically separate them try to implement the resolution, but then you're going to come up with a question, who's going to actually give the troops, the ground troops, for the UN peacekeeping operation, how to implement it, the cost. This is, going to, this is a, a crisis that has still many question marks and absolutely no trust between both sides, because without, without trust, it's difficult to even negotiate at the table, hence the important role that the UN has to play. Do you, do you think there needs to be a ceasefire in place before these talks take place? Uh, very difficult because the, the Houthis they, what are, they are pushing do, for it, yeah, aren't they? What they can do is continue what was what was uh, previously a five-day ceasefire. You continue a series of temporary ceasefires, renewable ceasefires over time. The first one lasted five days, but it fell apart. Once again, that trust is not there. Okay, Marco Vincenzo for now. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you.